No, no, I realize that. It's just you insane. You bet. Thanks, Eric. Because ours, it was pending until today. And for them not to even be able to get something planned where they needed their money. Yeah. Merchants is seeing no color. Yeah. Oh. So it's eight. Good evening. I'd like to call the annual meeting of the Holman School District to order. The first item on the agenda is election of annual meeting chairperson. Is there a second? I'll a second. That. Oh, no, who was the other? Lisa. Gotcha. Lisa. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to nominate Cheryl Hancock as chairperson of the 2014 school district annual meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried. And just a reminder, everyone um, in the audience, this is your opportunity to vote, but I would in invite everyone to participate in the meeting. Um, adoption of Robert's Rules of Order. In the past, we have always adopted Robert's Rules to keep the, order, the meeting in order. I would entertain a motion to adopt Robert's Rules of Order as the order of business for the, tonight's meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting Robert's Rules of Order, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Election of annual meeting parliamentarian. We also have um, a parliamentarian on duty um, for the evening. Are there any nominations? In the past, I think Gary has served in that role. I'll nominate Gary Dunlap. I'll Is, second it. There's a motion and a second to nominate Gary Dunlap to serve as parliamentarian. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Mm. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda was posted and published and shared with the media. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. I'd so move. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Approval of minutes. A copy of the minutes from the August 26, 2013 annual meeting were provided. There are copies on the back table, or should be, if you want to take an opportunity to look those through. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Also move. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Look to see if you're in there. The best way to get in the minutes is to make a motion or second it. So, okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the minutes. I would um, ask all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the annual meeting relative to any issue at this time? Mr. Brown, if you would speak into the microphone. And we would give five minutes, and if you would identify yourself as well. I think it might on. be on. Well, maybe He's not. Talking and it should be on. Anyhow, I'll try and say it long enough. I come to several meetings in a year. I come to several meetings in the year, and one thing that I probably this would be <laughs> would like to hear me say this, but this consent agenda. There's too many things, eight or ten items, go in one motion, and you never hear in discussion. And one of the things, the main job for the board, I think, is a lot to do with finance. And it's rare that you've ever said anything at a board meeting about spending or saving or anything. And I think there's too much that goes on these consent agendas that should have some discussion. Now, they always say, well, it was discussed before. Well, I don't know where all this stuff is discussed, but I've been to several meetings when nothing was discussed. It was done in a few minutes. And I really think there's, a, uh, just because I come to a meeting once in a while, I've got to change the whole thing. But I really do feel that <laughs> there's too much goes on that consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board or the meeting at this time? Mr. Barlow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to serve as a community member on the Finance Committee and look at a lot of these issues and try to 
prognosticate and predict <laughs> what the ebbs and flows of the future will be. And I just truly thank the staff and um, uh, for all the work they do in preparation for that meeting and preparing you. I hope, I'm assuming the board feels the same way and appreciating the work that staff <coughs> do. As we look towards the next 20 years, um, we're not sure where the future will take us. We hope the community will continue to grow and hope the school district will continue to grow. And maybe just one comment in totally my role as a parent in the district, as that community member on the finance committee, that we're at kind of an interesting planning stage along with the uh, partners with the village of Holman and a proposed tax uh, increment district um, that has the potential to really grow the community. At the same point in time, I do think that that district could impact, or the tax increment district could impact the, the school district in terms of increasing headcounts, increasing numbers. And, and my only comment related to that would be to, to ask staff and the, and the board to really <coughs> seriously consider and try to plot out your very typically uh, very organized way what the potential impacts on the district that might be. As we heard from uh, uh, Dr. Carlson in the first hour at around seven o'clock, you're a data-driven district, you're a fiscally responsible district. Um, you really have concern about student-teacher ratios as a major driving factor of your decisions. And so I think with those things in mind, uh, an analysis of potential impacts of, of this growth, and for those of you somewhat unfamiliar with this, there's about 28% of this tax increment district might include new residential um, properties, which hopefully some of those would be families with young children who would send them to the home and school district. And it just would be a good thoughtful um, approach, I think, for district staff and the, and the board to take a look at that seriously. Um, and that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the meeting this evening, the annual meeting? Okay, thank you. Then we will move on to reports. District Administrator's report, Dr. Carlson. Good evening and welcome again. My report will highlight our continuous improvement efforts in the school district, beginning with an overview of our strategic plan. I will then touch upon the focus areas and measures included in the 2013-14 annual report. And again, if you have not picked up a copy, I would encourage you to do so. Much of my presentation tonight is just moving through that annual report and, and finally, I will close <coughs> excuse me, with a few comments as we look ahead to the future. Our strategic plan is driven by the belief the school district of Holman is committed to continuous improvement at all levels of the organization in order, in order to improve student learning. As this organization implemented the continuous improvement process, vision, mission, values, focus areas have been developed through a consensus process involving representative stakeholders, resulting in improvement guides by using the Plan Do Study Act improvement cycle for the school district, buildings, departments, and programs. The plan assists the district with planning for the future, addressing performance goals and problems in a systematic way, focusing on results, Enhancing decision making that impacts student learning, stakeholders, employees, and finances. Building community involvement and support for school district initiatives. Within our six focus areas, we focus on specific goals that are measurable, attainable, results focused, and are time bound. The goals are intended to focus on specific areas in which the district believes it is important to improve in order to move toward our vision and live our mission. <clears throat> the vision of the school district is to educate every student to achieve global success. The leadership of the School Board of Education ensures high expectations in everything we do, beginning with a commitment to improving student learning and achievement. 
The mission of our school district describes our purpose and focuses directly on the service we provide our students as we educate and inspire students today and prepare them for tomorrow by ensuring that all students learn at high levels as they develop 21st century skills. So that our students have opportunities, we must continue to grow our partnership with the entire community. And finally, we know that we must operate and act in a fiscally responsible manner while ensuring well-rounded educational experiences. Our core values guide our behavior as an organization. We are committed to data-driven decision-making, as Mr. Barlow reminded us again as well, focusing on results in these four areas, student learning, continuous improvement, visionary leadership, and respectful behavior. The Board of Education has established six focus areas that are described in more detail on page three that guide our efforts and work. And again, you can see on the slide those six focus areas, beginning with, most importantly, student learning. The Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle is a four-step model that provides a framework for developing, testing, and implementing changes leading to improvement. PDSAs for each building and program can be found on the district's website under our district and continuous improvement. The annual report highlights the many measures used to describe and outline our progress in focus areas. As you review the summary for each measure, please note that the following questions are addressed. Why is this result measure important? What is the district's current status on this measure? What is the interpretation or prediction of the district's trend? And what can we learn by comparing our district's results to others? And again, the annual report, not only in the paper copy available tonight, can also be found on our district website. <clears throat> In the School District of Pullman, educators are committed to student learning by responding to four key questions. I don't have them on the slide, but uh, we have gone over those for a number of years, and we remind ourselves that first, what do we want our students to learn? How will we know when they have learned it? What happens if they don't know it? And what happens if they do know it? It is important to have as much accurate knowledge of each student's achievement as is possible through the district curriculum expectations and proficiency levels, standardized assessments, multiple classroom assessments, alternate assessments, and other measures assessing such things as work habits, citizenship, and other factors that could impact learning. This approach demonstrates a balanced, comprehensive, an instructionally relevant assessment system that promotes higher achievement levels and prepares students to be lifelong learners and compassionate, contributing members of society. Within the student learning focus area review in the annual report, you will see a number of different measures used to address specific grade levels and curriculum areas, including those, some of those that are listed on this slide. For the Wisconsin Knowledge and Concepts exam, WKCE, it's important to note that 2013-14 was the final year for reading and math as we move to new statewide assessments. Um, as I go through this, again, um, I'm not going to talk about each slide. We're going to move through these. You have them, the more detailed description in your annual report, and I would encourage you to read that. Uh, that will certainly help in your understanding. Here we have the map assessment data for math and the map assessment data for reading. ACT results, Ms. Savasky reported out on those not too long ago. And it's important to note that starting this year, all students in the state of Wisconsin will complete the ACT during their junior year advanced placement exams. So many of these you will also see in many of the uh, PDSA work that's going on in the school district as well. We also recognize that regular school attendance and school completion are important in today's world as we prepare students for the future. 
Attendance, here you have uh, attendance, which is really that face-to-face -face instructional contact between a student and teacher, which is so important. Uh, we have the high school graduation or completion rate as reported. The four-year cohort represents the population of students that completed high school in the traditional four years. Also, DPI produces a, the Department of Public Instruction produces a five-year and six-year cohort completion rate to include students who took more than four years to complete high school. And I believe those are included in your annual report as well. These rates honor the additional effort many students make to complete their high school education, as well as obligations under special education law and our own state constitution. Within the fiscal sustainability focus area review in the annual report, you will see a number of different measures used to address areas, including, and they're listed here, again, uh, the maintenance and operation costs, um, nutrition services, um, and uh, fiscal effectiveness of overall the school district where we look at expenditures per pupil, income, tax rate, fund balance, investment rating. Here you have the fiscal sustainability focus which tells us that being fiscally responsible is important and you see the, in this case, um, operations um, cost per square foot. Here you have the nutritional services fund balance, which is an overall measure of the financial stability of that program. With transportation, the school district of Holman's parents, students, and staff, and community stakeholders have identified cost as a key performance factor in the delivery of our transportation services. The fiscal effectiveness result measures here, um, it measures both student <coughs> performance and spending per student. Dr. Carlson? Yes. Could you just explain in the left-hand corner there are the um, arrows that indicate good, what that reflects? Sure, thank you. You'll notice like uh, here, um, uh, downward, lower, would be, is more positive, is more favorable. And let's see if I had, did I have, and in this one here, you see the targets and you can see the, uh, the red triangles, for example, and that, those set some target ranges. And so the note here, really what we're shooting for is to be between those targets. Thank you, Mrs. Hancock. <clears throat> Here you have the adjusted gross income per return, which is an indicator that measures the community's ability to fund education. And so again, and that has an upward arrow there. The gross school tax rate uh, is an indicator that measures the property tax rate applied to owners of property within the boundaries of the school district. So we have that measure that we monitor. We have the fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures and earlier in the budget hearing, you hear you heard a report out on that. And that measures the overall financial stability of our organization as well. As well as the Moody's investment rating is another measure that uh, we use and monitor as far as measuring the district's financial stability. Within the workforce focus area, uh, our people, our employees, which is, are so key to um, our success as a school district. In that area review in the annual report, you will see a number of different measures used to address areas including the highly qualified employee information measured by the number of national board certified teachers and teachers with master degrees, uh, employee satisfaction measured by compensation and grievance data, retention rate, absentee rate, and I should say that these focus areas, since they are relatively new for us, we continue to build upon these and develop them. So here you have the, uh, we've been so proud over the years as far as our staff, our teachers who have went, uh, moved on and um, earned their national board certification. And we also continue to monitor the master degrees um, of our teachers earned as well. 
I mentioned workers' compensation experience and the number of grievances. Again, just some measures um, that we look at as far as satisfaction. Um, retention rate, as well as our absentee rate. Within the newer focus area of customer stakeholder focus, review in the annual report, you will see a number of different measures used to address areas including, again, that classroom physical environment, nutritional, uh, the percentage of participation in our breakfast and lunch programs, price per meal, nutritional content of our meals, ridership on our school buses and vans, ride time on our buses, and the number of accidents. All of these, we feel, play a key role in what our customers and stakeholders expect. So breaking that down, you have, again, our classroom environment. One of the measures we look at is that we feel is important to student learning and the work environment is just simply uh, monitoring things such as temperature, humidity, like that, that classroom and building environment. The percentage participation is an overall measure of the rate at which, we, uh, which students utilize the nutritional services program and choose to um, enjoy the healthy food uh, that we produce or that we um, serve. Meal price is an overall measure of the cost students pay per meal in the nutrition services program. The, con the nutritional content of the food translates over to what our customers, our students and parents expect. A major contributor to the positive attitude with which students will enter the school building every day in their interactions with peers and adults on the way to and from school, including on our buses and vans. And so here you see the high rate of ridership that we have in our school district. We closely monitor the average ride time for our students. Safety. Oh, sorry about that. Safety was identified, has been identified by parents and school staff, community members, and taxpayers alike in a, um, as we've surveyed as the number one priority for school transportation. So that, I moved through that quickly, but hopefully it helps you, encourages, encourages you to take a closer look at the annual report. We know that school districts cannot do the important work of educating our youth without the support of so many. The support of this community, our parents, employees, volunteers, provide our students that are provided to our students is exceptional. So many commit their time and energy to help students. I want to first recognize and thank members of the Board of Education, your time dedication and commitment to providing our students a quality education while representing the constituents of our community is so greatly appreciated. You continually are faced with making difficult decisions that impact the school district, but you also enjoy the opportunity to celebrate those many opportunities that you help provide and make possible for our students. Your record as a board of providing visionary leadership, establishing policy, developing a budget that provides quality programming, along with being fiscally responsible, and holding employees accountable is to be commended. You continue to place students first in your decision making. So thank you to the board. And thanks to everyone who help home and students achieve and improve themselves. I've often said this, that educating children I believe is the greatest investment a community can make together. I'm just going to wrap up by just sharing some thoughts I have on opportunities. There are opportunities I believe our district must address in the coming school year. Ensuring the success of every student remains our primary purpose, opportunity, and challenge. Student achievement remains our central focus of what we are all about as a school community. Developing our staff is critical to the improvement process that must continue in order to enhance the quality of the education for our students. Continuing to improve upon the implementation of 
such things as the Common Core State Standards, changes in student assessments, and the new Educator Effectiveness Evaluation System for teachers and principals are all opportunities for us to make a positive impact on student learning. The 2014-15 budget once again includes the infusion of dollars into the area of technology. Our students and teachers should have the available technology at their fingertips. We are making progress, but we have much more work to do. Additional funding has been allocated to other critical areas within the organization. The measures we have taken to respond to the budgetary challenges have been difficult. We must continue to work on long-term solutions that will benefit student learning in our school district. I look forward as we live our vision and mission together. Perhaps the most challenging part is knowing how will we know we are achieving what we set out to do. Focusing on results is critical for us as we move forward. We continue to plan for the future as we live our vision of educating every student to achieve global success. So I leave you with, this is a strong and great school district with great people. Our students have a bright and hopeful future because of the collaborative efforts of all in our school community. So I want to personally thank everyone for your efforts and truly what you do makes a difference in the lives of our children every single day. So with that, I would like to introduce and bring Mr. Jay Clark up as he will uh, provide an overview for us on the long range facility plans that I have alluded to as well. Just take a moment here to Good evening, my name is Jay Clark and I'm the Associate District Administrator for the District and one of my responsibilities in that position is to serve as Administrative Representative to the Facilities Committee and another responsibility is to serve as the Administrative Representative to the Finance Committee and I think you'll see how both Facilities and Finance come together um, to be included in tonight's Facilities Report. Uh, tonight we'll focus on enrollment projections, facility instructional capacity at our school buildings, the long-range facilities plan that's developed out of looking at enrollment and facilities uh, capacity, and then how that uh, matches up with the district's long-term debt associated with uh, facilities. The models that you'll see tonight Show that the most recent year enrollment growth is greater than the prior year although still below the long-term average we've heard about 20 years and over the last 20 years we've averaged about 2 percent growth uh, in enrollment in the district we continue to monitor enrollment trends have patterned patterned pardon me those uh, with through the work of a consultant to develop enrollment forecasting models um, enrollment presented here will be updated once the third Friday in September pupil counts are completed and validated. So the enrollment presented here is a little bit old, does not represent what students came walking through the doors the first couple days of the school year, and for that matter some that didn't come through the doors at the first couple of days of school who we were expecting to show up. Um, the Forecast for the budget is based upon a five-year model. Um, that's inadequate for facilities projections because we need to be thinking further out than five years when it comes to facilities. So we've extended the five-year models that we use for budget forecasting in a oh, less sophisticated way than the five-year models are. So you'll see flat percentages referred to for future growth in enrollment in this model. We hope to by next year 
have a more sophisticated model in place for these long-term projections. But we've continued for a number of years. This flat percentage increase won't be new to how we forecast facility growth. It is, in fact, what we've relied upon for some years. But I think there's an opportunity for improvement for us there. So this chart shows the annual growth for the last five years. Note that there's variability reported in the annual growth. This is in column four, ranging from 3.31% to a low of 0.5%. And note in the far right-hand column, growth rates without public preschool. We monitor the impact of this student population very closely as this is one of the most difficult populations to forecast. If we looked at the last 20 years of growth, we'd see some of this type of variability, but not as much as we've had, honestly, in the last five years. A look at the last 20 years would reveal that enrollment growth has averaged nearly 2%, as I mentioned earlier. And so therefore, the enrollment increase has slowed in the last five years. Uh, July, four, uh, July 2014 revision of the enrollment projections for the 2014-15 year calls for a 1.49% increase in enrollment. Applying that 1.49% throughout the next five years leads to a forecasted 2018-19 enrollment of 4,194 students compared to the 2013-14 enrollment of 3,895. That five-year increase then would be just under 300 students, or 7.67%. This slide provides enrollment projections at the district level as a total of all enrollment. To evaluate the impact of enrollment on facilities, this district-wide enrollment projection needs to be further broken down by the grade level configurations we use as a district. So for example, our grade configurations are pre-K through fifth grade in elementary schools, six through eight at the middle school, and nine through 12 at the high school. This chart breaks down the projected district enrollment numbers to show the enrollment at each of those grade level groups in the district. Note the 2017-18 district-wide enrollment figure, again, 4,194, matches the value shown on the previous table. On this table, one can look at how the district-wide enrollment numbers are distributed across the grade level groups of the district. These grade level group numbers need to be compared then to the enrollment capacity of the district's current facilities at those very group levels. So again, starting with some summary information, if we're talking strictly instructional space in our facilities, this slide lists the capacity of district facilities at elementary, middle, and high school levels. The elementary school capacity has changed since last year. The buildings didn't shrink and we didn't abandon space, but what we did have was uh, action related to um, uh, the maximum class size. The new 2014-15 capacities are shown in this breakdown by building. You can see 557 being the enrollment capacity at Viking Elementary School, slightly larger than the remaining three elementary schools at 501. And uh, if the calculator was working right, that should add up to 2060. Francis may be checking me out. Um, that compares to last year's capacity of 2,220. And here, this uh, in the slightly lighter shading you can see was the pre-2014-15 uh, capacities at the school. 600 at Viking and 540 at the other three elementary schools. Uh, a net difference of 160 students. And again, this change was due to the lowering of the maximum class size from 30 students to 27 students at the 4K through third grade levels. So again, these are instructional capacities as they stand today in our facilities. I should mention the middle school capacity was studied by the school districts, buildings and grounds, or facility committee, 
uh, during the 2013-14 school year. That study examined the current use of the facilities and the effect of current use on the facilities capacities at the middle school. Uh, that study is ongoing. Initial modeling suggests a capacity greater than the 920 students uh, traditionally identified for the building. During this upcoming year, we'll continue to meet with building staff to verify the current capacity and use of spaces in that building. Hope to have a number finalized by the end of the year. Uh, the high school underwent a similar study in 2011-12, and the at one time traditional 1,200 uh, pardon me 1,200 student capacity was re-identified at 1,288 based upon that study. I should mention, um, beyond the instructional capacity, the high school facility study did reveal that there were some non-instructional space issues at that building, uh, issues related to student circulation capacity, crowding in hallways, constriction points in hallways, and undersized common spaces uh, used by the students uh, in that facility. This chart takes the enrollment numbers that we talked about previously and the grade, grade level uh, capacities and overlays them to give us a facility capacity at elementary, middle, and high school compared to enrollments. And here you can see there one number stands out, 925 in that pink shading. That's because the capacity at the middle school is 920 students, at least identified currently. And this would show then that in 2019-20, uh, the projected enrollments would exceed the capacity of the facility. And so this is the very purpose of a long-range facilities planning study is to determine when these student populations are forecasted to exceed the capacity of the buildings. Extending out to 2025-26, this next slide, remember the elementary capacity um, that we had identified uh, with that new capacity, uh, the elementary projected date of enrollment exceeding capacity went from 2025-26 to 2023-24. Does that make sense? So it's two years earlier. Mm -hmm. Easiest way to say that. Also contributing to the earlier date of elementary construction or facility space needs is the movement of 4K instructional delivery from community sites to elementary school buildings. We need to remain attentive to that and the impact that that is having upon the capacity of our elementary schools. And third Friday count information will help to, uh, we're not having less students, it's just where we're placing the students. And the high school here, a uh, capacity of 1,288, would show uh, projected enrollment exceeding capacity in 2024-25. Any questions on enrollment projections or capacity and how those two come together to form the chart we see there? For those who've been around for a while, this is the oldest version of uh, this chart. We've been presenting theirs for years to kind of in a graphic uh, text uh, describe what's happening. This was four years ago. And you can see at that time, uh, we were forecasting 1.85% growth and enrollment projections at that time called for a facility addition at the middle school in 2015. It'd be next fall. Well, that was four years ago. And lesser than expected enrollment increases has, as you've seen, extended that out. This actually shows the 2006 and 2009 construction of uh, middle school addition and uh, it said elementary new, that's actually Prairie View. Uh, this was the next year or three years ago, what we were looking at. I'm gonna flip through these quickly. This was two years ago. This was one year ago, and what you can see is the pattern of the line flattening and uh, us pushing construction out to later dates. In fact, it continues to show that 2006 construction on the chart, and this year's, which is the next slide, I took some of those things off. Those seem old enough where we could migrate those off and just focus from 2009 forward. And so in that graphic illustration, this is what um, the information I presented earlier on that table would look like. 
Now, now could you go back the um, the closest expansion on the high school? What date is that? Uh, 2024 25 school year. Okay. Are we considering moving that up? No, the instructional space capacity of 1,288 students would suggest we won't get anywhere near that in the near term. Okay, I know um, you touched on it briefly, um, areas of the high school, I mean hallways and commons being increasingly crammed, that would be... <laughs> I didn't say increasingly crammed, no. those are your words, but I did say that there are circulation issues, yeah. <laughs> That'd be an understatement. <laughs> well, we've been there and looked, uh, we're proud of the students and how they're managing that situation. They do an amazing uh, job. But the facility committee is aware of that. I'd invite you to attend any facility committee you'd like to, to learn more about um, not only that evaluation, but some of the options that we have as we continue to look at that real issue in the hallways without necessarily putting an addition onto the high school. But that's a, that's a real issue, and as well as the comments um, during the lunch periods. So if you, the, the circle of life area and the corridors immediately adjacent to that, as well as the commons area are two areas of need our attention. I would say the, um, the commons not so much to me that stand out. Um, the circle of life we're not allowed in during lunch, so that's not a big issue. The hallways connecting um, the circle of life to the 100 wing and the 200 wing. That doorway as it narrows in is where the, the biggest flow stoppage happens. You call that a constriction point. That's the one exactly the one I it was would. referring to earlier. Yeah, it's the 200 wing is particular yeah. problem. 100 wing, yes, but the 200 wing constriction just past the circle of life is a particular problem. Um, I know we observed it for class one time. We found that um, first, between first and second hour was the slowest because, you know, kids are tired. And if anybody's interested in seeing, I would, you know, more than invite you to come down and view the backup. <laughs> Interesting. Something worth watching. Yeah, and uh, as we studied it over a number of days, trying to analyze whether it was a day of the week, it was a particular semester during the year, um, we didn't attribute it necessarily to the sleepiness of students, um, but the scheduling of students. And it appears that there are some um, events and some schedulings that just naturally create more students flowing through that hallway. Um, so it may be different between uh, first and second or second and third. Um, so it depends upon the specific schedules of the students. At least that was our observed pattern, mm -hmm. uh, the most common thread. I don't know if your data suggested anything different. I, but we did it freshman year, but. Yeah. Those observations are valid, though. I think that the staff would, uh, they had much the same observations as we did, Alex. So I, a lot of continuity in the observations there. Mr. Clark, I think it would be too important to note that the um, projections we're looking at it for the middle school and the elementary are new buildings. Um, the high school is an addition. And I think just to put this out there futuristic that at some point in time, our district, our community is going to have to have that conversation of how big of a high school do we want to have. And is 1,600 students the size we want in our high school or do we you know so do we do the addition or do we look at potentially futuristic again looking at a second high school instead of 1600 that's a huge that's a huge high school so uh, thank you because as time is as you can tell from the charts we kept thinking it was going to be closer and closer and closer the, the thinking at the time of the Prairie View project was pretty clear on what we were gonna do next, but as more and more time passes, I'm not so sure that we would all agree that this plan, a new middle school, a new elementary school in addition to the high school is still what's in the best interest, the community and the students. Um, I continue to carry those forward because that's the most recent study and recommendation we have, but not necessarily having to be that way.
Yeah, there's a lot of new trends in learning and education and delivery. So th those kind of things could, you know, Tom has talked about technology often. Th those kind of things could impact it. And where are we on that cutting edge of, of those sorts of things? But yes, that's going to be something that is, at some point in time the district will have I to could, talk about. I would say that, and I look at uh, Ms. Savasky, Mr. Vogler out in the crowd. We've very preliminarily already, that's on their radar. Uh, they've already started to conceptually look at uh, those middle years. And what might that look like 10, 15, 20 years out? So that's a key piece, as you're alluding to, in any kind of construction project, really designing that concept. So we're, we've started uh, very on the front end of that conversation. Well, why get out on the front end of this? Well, this illustrates why. It takes three years, really, if you're going to provide yourself adequate opportunity for pre-referendum activities and proper design and construction and uh, an occupancy period. Uh, it's close to three years in advance of the actual occupancy that you'd want to get started. As I promised earlier, we talked a little bit about how the district uh, manages uh, finances and debt relative to construction. This uh, chart is longstanding. It shows uh, the gray line, the flat line on top is a $2.15 mill rate, a rate that was some time ago set as a desired limit for the amount of taxation we'd have related to debt. And uh, we've been below that. Uh, the other thing I'd point out in this illustration is this would be that tax rate associated with the debt for through 2025 and you can notice a pronounced drop in 2017 the idea being that you could at the 2017 time frame occur, incur additional debt for construction needed at that time potentially a new middle school and you could fill the drop in tax rate with the additional debt associated with the construction of that middle school remain below the $2.15 and potentially introduce no new tax rate impact for school facilities. So that's how we've managed the long range finances related to facilities debt. That's the plan. Do we have an older chart um, demonstrating like the, the cost effectiveness of having those mobile educational units? The ones they used to have at the middle school? Um, <laughs> no. Short answer, do we have a, an analysis of the long-range fiscal? No. Um, at that time, uh, those were, oh, they were called temporary. Uh, they were long-term <laughs> temporary is what they were. Uh, no one had the vision that those would be used for instruction for a long period of time. They were. They migrated towards a boardroom. Uh, at the end of their service to the district. Um, we purchased some and put them on the end of the middle school. Is that right, Mr. Daly? Mm -hmm. We started at one of them at Viking and then one of them and then moved them both. So, uh, no, we've not done recently a study of those. Um, last time the school district visited that was some time ago, and those were never uh, uh, viewed as most desirable they're an option I think that they were used as an option when there was no other option just I'm just curious um, who designed the high school the company that designed the high school was called Dana Larson Rubel and Associates I mean looking at it I I know what Alex is saying I've seen that uh, I've seen the crowds that cut through those aisles and I just didn't it seems like a some just seems like it's so obvious to me that would happen but um, did they design it thinking that those certain wings would have different well it was only designed for 800 students correct me if I'm wrong I will correct you it was designed for 1200 students in fact the wings 100 and 200 were designed to have additional classrooms if you can imagine that added on the ends of the wings which would have only increased the number of students circulating through the circle of life so uh, we, as you're implying, Mr. Cruz, are a little bit puzzled by how you could have an increasing number as you come from the end of the hallway towards the circle of life, an increasing number of classroom doors emptying into that hallway without the hallway getting wider. 
Because right. it seems as you have more and more, you would need to continue to expand the circulation pace in the hallway. So or a second it is story. what we have. I understand. I'm not blaming anybody. I was just curious. That so. doesn't. Uh, we're not exactly sure of the design features of that ourselves. And then to I, I think uh, this is a bit of speculation. There were fire and security doors added to those hall wings, is my guess. The original design did not call for those. If you stand there at the circle of life and you look down that hallway, the narrowest point is right at the end where the doors close because there's um, pilasters or uh, jutting out where the door frames fit. It actually narrows the hallway even further. Um, those are some of the design features that we were looking at potentially modifying if we were going to improve circulation, getting the maximum width we could. That building looks hard to manipulate to change the design. It seems like it would be difficult to do. May have to face that difficulty though. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Barlow. In terms of other options, not so sure the temporary trailers float my boat or <laughs> my trigger, but um, you know, what we see there on that, that graphic is just new construction versus remodeling. And as we think about a new middle school would it be opportune time for some kind of retrofitting and or re revitalization of the existing middle school? Because I, I my thinking is that you'd keep the current middle school online and, and add a new middle school. Is that the, the assumption with your model and projection? The model that was, uh, this was based on yes. It would be to add a middle school at a second site based upon the physical site limitations of the current middle school. So in terms of staying underneath that $2.15 levy limit, not like I want us to broach that or get too close to that, but the idea of not only new construction, but the consideration of maintaining our current property so they have as long as life as possible, hopefully something that the district is looking at or considering as well um, to, to get the most use out of our current buildings. And I don't know in your projections where we look at some place like a Viking, like an Evergreen, and their projected lifespan, you know, it's all fine to plan for new buildings, but I hope we're not forgetting to look back and see when we need to maintain our current structures and um, because that can kind of bite us on the tail end if we're not looking at potential using revenues to maintain our structures and just looking to build new and to then having more to take care of. So. This has become a particular challenge for us, as Mr. Daly often reminds the facility committee. Um, we maintained our existing facilities on a healthy diet of referendum dollars. So when we would have a referenda to build a new school, we would include projects to update the quality of our existing schools. And that was all well and good when every five years you're having a building project. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So to your very point, it's become particularly challenging for the district to find enough resources to maintain existing facilities without the inflow of money associated with the referendum. Mr. Daly, yes? It's a valid point, one that, uh, one that the committee has looked at. And in fact, presented a full report to the board, and the board approved that and is continuing to search for ways to find the dollars to uh, um, demonstrate good stewardship with the facilities that we have. And I think we also included sinking funds in referendums to allow for that for the newer buildings to provide some of those Absolutely. Those we were forward thinking the, yeah. when it came to the newer school buildings. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. schools like Viking and the middle school and the high school um, have no such sinking fund. And it, it, it seems to me that when we did do the most recent work on the middle school, the referendum, the remodeling, all of that, that I think you indicated that the land uh, capacity of the land that we really did maximize um, the middle school property and did exactly that during the last go-round with the middle school 
Yeah, there were a couple of issues there. One was the physical size of the site and how you're going to provide for accurate, ac accommodate good circulation around the building as well as within the building. And then there was also some agreement that they, we weren't sure that any more 920 middle schoolers at one site was such a good idea. <laughs> And I think that was something, again, that's a philosophical <laughs> thing, even at the elementary level. You know, we talked about the 540 versus 501 students in an elementary was kind of where we were at, and the 925, and again, having to have those conversations about the size of a, of a high school. Yes, yeah. All those things will need, deserve revisiting as we get closer to construction. Well, Any other questions? Oh, that was the facilities report. Okay, then we will move on to treasurer's report and the audit summary. Lisa Collins is our treasurer, and I don't know if Mr. Clark, it looks like, is staying there with her. Oh, pilot. Hello, I'm Lisa Collins, and I'm serving as the current board treasurer. And as treasurer, I'll be providing information on the district's um, financial status. There we go. Um, as required to give the status report under state statute 120.11, um, this needs to be presented at every annual meeting and needs to entail these areas that include receipts and expenditures at cash balances of the school district amount of the amount of the deficit bills payable of the school district the amount necessary to be raised by taxation for the support of the schools of the school district for the ensuing year. And it also is required to pay the interest and in principal of any debt due during the ensuing year. This provides a budget summary which is required under statute 65.90. Okay, I'll do that. Um, the next section that we'll be looking at here is the receipts and expenditures of the school district since the last um, annual meeting um, are presented in the 2014-15 proposed budget as well. You'll see that in that document as well um, on, your t in, on one of the forms that you had gotten in the back of the room there. You can also find um, this information on the school district website. Um, column C of the document displays the unaudited actual numbers for 2013 and 14, and so that's where those numbers are coming from. Basically looking at the total revenues of all the funds it kind of represents the sum of the revenues for each fund less transfers made between the funds and that total is at the bottom of the column here on the, the bottom right which is fifty one million five hundred ninety eight thousand two hundred and ninety eight <clears throat> Um, this next slide, um, okay. Okay. Um, the next table lists the total expenditures for each fund, um, also presented in the 2014-15 proposed budget form there. Um, for example, the general fund expenditures are found on page 2, line 80. Um, the number in line C is 41,171,820. You can find the total expenditures for each of the funds in column C on the line listed in this table. The total amount at the bottom is 
980,244. Um, the next slide is dealing with the um, district's cash balance. As of June 30th, 2014, it is 11 million four hundred ninety-five thousand one hundred and twelve. Um, important to note here that this is a uh, cumulative amount from multiple pages within the audit report. Um, you know? okay. This chart is looking at the um, district's operational general fund cash balance at the end of each month throughout the course of the annual budget cycle. And important to note that while the district's cash balance is approximately 6500000 at the end of June, that the cash balance could become, you know, negative, um, looks quite a bit different by, the, by November and May. And so at any point in time when you're looking at, at this cycle throughout the year, it could be a little bit deceiving as far as what, what we actually have available. Um, I know that when I was on the finance committee, we would look at just different points, pricks in time throughout the year, and you'd be concerned that, wow, we may not have enough money to carry us out through the rest of the year. And I was assured um, by those that had done this before that um, there's planning involved with this and that, um, you know, it may also look different at the beginning of the year. Don't get overly confident about that amount of money that we have there. Um, so in those situations where there seems to be a lack of money involved, um, such as in November, and we have some bills that may need to be paid, there we're able to do some temp temporary debt service um, borrowing and to meet those cash obligations. The, the fund balance um, in, for the district as of June 30th of 2014 was 11 million four hundred and ninety five thousand one hundred and twelve again an accumulative amount from the audit report did I skip some okay um, this is um, a chart that is showing the, well, it also appears on the, the annual report on page 20. Um, and what it is, it's showing um, that it has a fund balance as a total expenditures, kind of showing um, comparative amounts. So, what we're looking at is we wouldn't have, is that what it's saying? That we wouldn't have not been updated yet to show the 22.9% value for 2013-14 because we, we don't have that information yet. At the time the annual report booklet was put together, the audit had not been completed, so we did not yet have the final fund balance figure. Mm -hmm. And we do have that information now, even though it doesn't appear on the chart, so it would be 22.9% going up slightly. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> this also wants to show, though, that there was a dip in the 2007 and 8 and the 2008 and 9 um, areas there. You can kind of see where that graph kind of goes down, and that was due to the 4K program startup. So just kind of interesting to see those fluctuations there, but there were significant reasons for that. So, okay. um, talking about uh, the difference between the deficit and surplus within the treasurer's report, um, deficits occur obviously when there's more expenditures occurring during the bu budget cycle, um, during that point in time of the year when there is revenues taken in. So the opposite of a deficit is a surplus um, and that's something that we kind of come to expect at certain points in time throughout the year um, and if you look at page 2 line 57 of the proposed budget that was discussed earlier um, you'll see kind of that that issue there um, under column c unaudited un 
audited total revenues and other financing sources listed is 41 million six hundred and thirty nine thousand three hundred and ninety two Um, total liabilities payable the balance sheet and the auditors reports listed the general fund total liabilities as of June 30th 2014 were 1 million nine hundred thirty seven thousand two hundred and eighty four and these liabilities are equivalent to like outstanding bills and obligations payable by the district and so there are these different categories of which those um, obligations fall under which are these accounts payroll benefits and amounts due to other funds taxation um, later in the agenda a recommendation will be presented on the tax levy for the 2014-15 school year um, so we'll be looking at that and currently the estimated tax levy amount of 16 million 74,886 was presented earlier in this evening at the budget hearing so finalized tax levy is pending further information and determines the maximum permitted levy amount debt due the district's debt at this at the end of the 2013-14 budget year is a proc is 24 million 658,000 which is reflected on line 100 on page 3 of the proposed budget for the 2014 cycle budget summary um, so the proposed budget document summarizes the 2014-15 budget see the far right hand column D labeled budget 2014-15 um, and those changes were outlined earlier this evening I think everybody was here for the budget hearing so really the treasurer's report focuses primarily upon a report on last year's budget and how it finished out but <coughs> making reference here to the summary information that was provided earlier this evening just to recap um, of what was covered in in the treasurer's report um, receipts and expenditures cash balance um, deficit uh, bills payable taxation debt due and the budget summary at this let me well, I was going to say uh, we had some more slides to present as a part of the treasurer's report, but, but it was already covered. It was, and so I like, don't see hey, a whole lot of the audience members from the budget <laughs> hearing. So, for the sake of brevity, let's just uh, pass through those quickly, unless somebody has a question on fiscal effectiveness, gross tax rate, mail rate is one of them too. Police Police. Rating. Yep. Those are all. Those are some of the fiscal uh, measures that were reported in the annual report booklet, and those were covered earlier this evening. Uh, thoroughly so thank you um, the meeting with the auditor we met with with the auditor and um, Engelson and Associates on August 18th and they were able to present us with um, their findings of what um, they found when they assessed um, last year's cycle the 2014 cycle um, So basically at this point, um, the auditor said it was an unqualified opinion. Which is what we want. It's a good thing. It doesn't sound like the no, right words to use, so it confuses me a little bit. Is that a typo there? But, they qualify um, something that's not a good thing. Right. <laughs> this and, and this had actually changed since my presentation was started earlier. So there was one finding actually at the meeting. There was, they hadn't identified that, but um, since then they came back and had that one finding. Um, and reported the management letter which was discussed earlier right at the regular meeting tonight mr. Miller covered the um, finding related to the officials account and the corrective actions that the school district has taken regarding that also just with the audit report um, 
copies um, were shared with the board members at the first meeting in September, um, presented for approval at the second meeting in September, and a copy of the complete audit um, are available to the public on the school district website, so we'll be able to have access to that. Correct, and another thing we can mention is the full um, document related to the budget document that's been referred to a number of times tonight is also on the school district's website as well as the management letter. So we know not everybody can make it out to attend these meetings, so all that information is out there. That's correct, Mr. Clark. So unless there's any other questions, um, I would ask that the electorate in attendance uh, to consider the following resolution. Who says that? Chairman? Is and that, Chairman? I think we have something before that. Something though. else. Do New business, correct? Oh? No, no, no. no? Okay. Just to accept the treasurer's oh. oh, just to accept the treasurer's report. Okay. So, at this time, I would entertain a motion to accept the treasurer's report. Mr. Barlow and Mr. Daly seconded or... Do you get that? We're getting people in the audience now. Any questions? Seeing none, a motion has been made and seconded to accept the treasurer's report. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then, new business. Um, salaries of board members. Presently, board members are paid $2,720 per year and $50 per each posted special meeting and $50 uh, per diem rate. Um, I would let, leave it to the constituents to.